McKenna, do we call the meeting to order? Are you ready? Would you mind taking roll? Right. Commissioners present in establishing a quorum. Commissioners Blair, Lewis, Bull, Dawkins, and Nugent. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, we have we set aside three minutes. Um, if any members of the public would like to, um, you know, wander up to the microphone and speak about any topic that is not on tonight's agenda, you're welcome to do that. Or anyone in the Zoom room, you see anybody? Any attendees in the waiting room? If you'd like to comment, feel free to raise your hand, and I can give you speaking power. We're at a, a slight disadvantage because so we can't see the waiting room, but um, great. I'd like to uh, say that we do appreciate having members of the public in person. Thank you very much. Next item is approval of minutes from the prior meeting. And if anyone has had a chance to review, Was there any edits? I move to approve the minutes. Thanks, Brandy. Do I have a second? I second it. Thanks very much, Kelsey. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion passes five to zero, Hannah. Okay, next item up, new business. We've got some great things to talk about this evening. First item is Mr. Swanson. Always appreciate seeing you, Ben. You too. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Great. Excellent. I know last time I was yelling into my laptop, so I got headphones this time. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, Kate wanted me to stop by and just uh, talk a little bit about um, – I know we talked, we touched on the pros plan during our CFP update, but get into that a little bit more as well as uh, the parks element in our comprehensive plan as part of the whole preparation process for our large comp plan amendment that's coming up. And so uh, essentially what this, the, the PowerPoint that I'm using, and it's, it's kind of a doctored version of it, is the same PowerPoint that uh, was used to present to both the planning commission back in January, February, and city council during the uh, pros plan adoption. And so just to um, start off here, Hannah, would you mind um, pulling that PowerPoint up and running it for me? I blanks out my screen when I'm trying to do it. Chairman Bull, uh, while that's coming up, I did want to make sure it's on the record that uh, Commissioner Lockhart did notify us that she wouldn't be absent this evening. She has a, a sick child. Okay. For the record. Perfect. Thank you. And then we can just go ahead and jump into the next slide. So talking with Kate, I understand that you've been over this uh, quite a few times. So just one more time as far as the overall process with our comp plan update. And uh, I'm sure as you discussed, it's a it's a uh, starts with the state under the Growth Management Act. And then from there, um, it's almost like the Russian doll where it's slowly one contained in the other. Then it goes to our our regional planning authority, which is Puget Sound Regional Council, which adopted Vision 2050. And then from there, Snohomish County takes all of that information, develops their comp plan based off of it for the county. And then us down the road, um, we go ahead and develop our comp plan based on the uh, criteria and goals and policies uh, from those, uh, the three before that. So this evening, what we're really going to focus on is the orange, um, the uh, parks and rec element and the pros plan. And so with the um, 
parks and recreation element in the comp plan, you'll see it. It's not very many pages. It's actually a, 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 a pretty pretty thin chapter. And that's by design. Um, the body of the comp plan, we are really trying to, I know it's a, it's, you know, altogether, it's a pretty big document, but what we're really trying to do is keep it highlights and at, a, at a, a level where the members of the public can go through and peruse through. And then if they have additional interest, we have these other items that are adopted uh, by reference in the appendix, in appendices. Um, and pros plan being one of them, you have the sewer plan, you have the water plan, you have the stormwater plan. This is where all the numbers and all the data lives. And so if somebody's very curious and wants to go down to this level, we adopt that uh, pretty unwieldy for, for people to read. And the pros plan, uh, it's it's a product of the overall plan itself, it is a product of the comp plan, but it's also a product of the uh, Recreation and Conservation Office. It's a Washington state office. And what they do is much like Puget Sound Regional Council does for transportation, they are the funding source for our parks. And so the majority of the grants we get to develop our parks comes from uh, Recreation and Conservation Office or RCO. And so, um, so RCO requires us to update our pros plan every six years. And unfortunately that is not on the same timeline as the comp plan. Um, there are a few documents and, and, and uh, uh, requirements of the of the state that they've tried their best of the years to line those things up. It just doesn't line up. So we just kind of do our best with it. And you'll see um, coming up here, the good news is, is at least when we're developing the pros plan and adopting it, we were doing the new vision for Monroe. So we did have that input as we went through the process. If you go to the next slide, please, Hannah. And so, um, so again, Pros plan similar to the comp plan. Um, this mandate actually comes from RCO, um, and obviously they use the Growth Management Act as a basis for this. But our pros plan, just like the comp plan, has to address our next 20 years of growth, and that's why when we did it early, you'll see in the pros plan and even in even in the the park element, you'll see some areas in there that are basically say hold for the 2024 comp plan update. And so when that goes through the park board and the Park Board goes through and does its amendments. Planning Commission is the gatekeeper for everything, whether that's you know roads or housing or whatever. When all that comes through, then Planning Commission will look at that as the whole package. And that's for a couple reasons: is to ensure consistency with the uh, goals and policies of the the new goals and policies of the comp plan. And then the second thing is we don't want anything to conflict with the, each other. And so if we're planning a new park somewhere, and Parks is planning a major arterial in that same area that's what we want to avoid. And so that's why you'll see the, the planners are always the gatekeepers of the comp plan. Hence, everything funnels through planning commission when it goes to a recommendation for council. And so when when we go to update this, this uh, what's presumably chapter seven or just call it the parks element, and we go to do those updates to the pros plan that were held off till 2024, the majority of that work will happen at the park board. And then the park board will develop its recommendation as a package will come through to the planning commission. And so, um, so with this, just like with the pros plan, um, it's a it's a 20, 20 year view on um, the needs of the community. And if you go to the next slide, please, Anna. And then, so uh, like I said, this was developed uh, right around the same time as as the vision was. And so that spirit was very much included in the development of the pros plan. And so um, the the equitable access, obviously, being a, a a very big one to the uh, to the mayor, um, and then um, also to the individuals that we surveyed, and we'll take a look at some of those surveys when we come up here. Next slide, please, Anna. And so this was our overall planning process for the pros plan. Um, started back in in 2020, and then wasn't adopted um, until February 2022. And so during this time, and again, I have some slides on it, um, there was a, a lot of outreach that took place. And um, what the visioning process actually modeled their outreach process off this pros plan, which I can't take any credit for. That was actually MIG, our consultants, that did a great job with that, but um, uh, essentially created a new way for us to do outreach, which is really working out well. And so um, it started with uh, inventory of existing use, uses, um, uh, the assessment, which involved, a, again, a lot of outreach, um, some user groups, 
and then uh, went into strategies and then the overall action plan. And then next, please. And so with the planning process, uh, much like the comp plan process is going through, we had our, our stakeholder groups, um, key leaders, interviews, the joint boards and commissions where park, park board and planning commission got together. You can see the snapshots of the surveys that were sent out in both Spanish and English. Um, then we, once that initial data was gathered, they did some priori prioritization workshops. And then, um, and then obviously National Night Out's a big one for any time you're trying to reach the public. That's always a great, great venue. Um, what's not listed here is they do they did do a, a few other outreach um, uh, um, events with the public, but uh, the National Night Out is always always a big one and always a good one for people to um, give comments and give feedback on. Uh, and as you can see, approximately uh, 1,100 participants. Next slide, please. And then uh, organization of the chapters uh, starts with the standard in introduction. And again, it looks at our existing assets, what we have. Um, then you go into the needs of what are we going to need in the next 20, 20 years. Um, and that accounts for, you know, population increase, um, uh, needs and desires of the community, and then uh, especially focusing on any areas that were lacking resources. Uh, vision and goals, just like the comp plan has, has vision and goals that go along with it. The pros plan building off of that also has its own visions and goals. And then finally, the chapter five with the implementation. Next slide, please. Um, so we do have appendices of appendices. So this pros plan will be appendices to the comp plan. This, the pros plan itself also has that. Um, again, it has a lot of the numeric back there, but it does give you, if anybody cares to look, it gives you the questions that were asked during, uh, during our, our, for the questionnaire. Um, the, um, all of our outreach is, is documented back in those chapters, things like funding strategies um, that get a little more on the Excel spreadsheet side um, are also stuck back there. Next slide, please. Next slide. So this is the actual plan itself. And like I said, it, it took a look at existing uh, existing resources. And so this map, what you're seeing right now was actually the map out of our previous pros plan that we had uh, the prior six years, uh, just identifying essentially our existing facilities. As you can see, even back then, the uh, the Cadman site, the Skycomish River Park site uh, that's, hashed, that's hashed in um, the green there, has been on the city radar for a long time. We're still working on that right now um, through uh, working through negotiations with Cadman. We expect that hopefully to have transferred over to the city in the first quarter of this year. But you will see these legacy projects. Um, the synthetic fields over at Lake Ty, that was on our capital facilities list for, I want to say, maybe 10, 12 years before we found funding for it. And so it's, it's important with these old documents to, to take a look at the previous inventory. And then next slide, please. And then um, uh, compare it to the needs of the residents today. And so uh, here's just kind of a snapshot. I won't go through them of what they were of of what we focused on and feedback we received from that public outreach. And next slide, please. So just a sample question, um, and then how we received as city staff the data back um, when they when they put that information out there. And so they tried to ask the questions in a in a very positive way. Um, the company that they actually subconsulted through um, did have consultants to ensure that the the survey questions were accurate and double checked. So it tried not to uh, give a balance to any side of an answer. Next slide, please. And then this one, this was this was a uh, more of a feel to see is the is the community interested in increasing our park system and i'll get to a slide that'll that'll show the numbers and bottom line is we're going to need to go out for a bond in order to do many of these improvements that the community wants and so during this pros uh, plan we put that question out to the community on how how would they feel um, obviously going into that process is very expensive um, just to make the effort to to go out for the bond and so what the city wanted to do is just see if there was the, the feeling out there that the, the residents would support it. And next slide, please. And then this one uh, gets into to park access. And so the, 
the rule of thumb, and this is something that um, during my research, the CDC references, the um, um, uh, uh, Federal Transportation uh, references it, and it's a uh, essentially a a a ten minute or a half mile walk within a park, and specifically those are you know neighborhood parks in many cases. However, they can be larger. For instance, like Lake Ty. Um, that's that's the goal is to is to get that and that's what's considered walkable um, and so that's the goal to get those uh, uh, within the the areas and so I know we discussed last time the the North Hill area um, as the area where they're they're focusing money and resources to get a park up there that's an area that was identified you also see that North Kelsey property um, right now is currently commercial however there there is there isn't a park down there um, and then you'll also see the blue asterisk on the map, one in the downtown, one in the Northwest UGA and one in the Northeast UGA. And that's what I was, I was referencing when we go to do this comp plan update, we need to address those things at that time. And so this is something we'll tackle now. And what those, uh, what those blue asterisks are, they're just generally in this area right now. We didn't know, um, uh, where the community would would generally like those northeast. Again, it's difficult to pinpoint, especially in the UGAs, down to a specific land area. Um, but uh, but this obviously need more discussion when we go through and do the entire comp plan update because it's more than just parks. We know we have to account for transportation, we have to account for housing and those kind of things, and so we don't want it to uh, not reference back and forth between the chapters if we do kind of shift to an area or look for a site. Next slide, please. And then trails. Um, this is something that we'll probably be seeing more of. Uh, we're going to start next year as far as just a very specific trails plan. Um, we went through in the pros plan and we did a good job, not a great job with uh, analyzing our trail systems. And so what we have planned for next year is to actually get down and really start getting into details such as hiring a company to go through and analyze the surface of our trails. Um, number one, that's for existing conditions because since those trails have been put down, they have are reaching or have reached the end of their lives. And so they're gonna need to be resurfaced. There's a lot of uh, push up from root systems that are, that are going underneath and then ADA accessibility. We wanna make sure that we still have that. And so um, that's part of it. Uh, really looking at future trail connections. We have some general locations to the uh, going towards Everett um, to connect in with that trail system, and then also going south to connect in with King County's trail system. But again, not a lot of real groundwork has been done on those, and so we are going to turn around and revisit that uh, uh, next year. Next, please. And then maintenance needs. So this is a big one that has been neglected from many of the plans that I've worked on, but I'm happy to see is in here. So it shows what what is the ongoing cost of the ask. If we want a new park, you pay for that park, but that cost doesn't end there. And so what they did in this pros plan, which they haven't done before, is they went through and started analyzing what the maintenance responsibilities of the city is for these parks. And so as you can see, um, in 2008, we had 17.3 acres per full-time employee. Um, and then in 2020, now we have 26.2 acres per full-time employee. And so our park system is growing and our responsibilities are growing. However, our staff isn't growing. And so that's where we get a lot of calls for, you know, hey, the trash is overflowing down here. And it's it gets really hard, especially during the summer and you have event seasons because you really focus a lot of your maintenance staff making the park of wherever the event's taking place look very, very nice because you want those visitors and everyone that's coming down there to have a good experience, but then you have to sacrifice that time from another park. So the grass may be getting longer. Like I said, the trash may start overflowing. And so those are things that we've been working on. We've been working on um, with both the city administrator and the mayor. They recognize it. And so um, so we, we did get two additional part-time uh, uh, summer help uh, in our, our next two years for our budget, which helps us out a lot also, but um, we will be in the future need to grow the department with additional maintenance staff to keep up on the parks. Next slide, please. And then go ahead. So just like with the, with the comp plan has a vision, the pros plan also has a vision. And so it's, again, it's the, it's 
this document is subordinate to the overall comp plan, but in order to create that focus around specifically our, our parks and natural areas, um, they adopted a vision specific for this pros plan. And as you can see, there's many echoes of our uh, current vision for the city in there, um, but there's the, uh, there's the vision for you to take a look at. And then um, pros plan goals. So this is very much, very different from the comp plan is, is the quantity. Um, it's, it's tailored down because we are dealing with very specific areas. And so these are more high level goals. When you look at our, our comp plan, I can remember chapter one or chapter two, you will see several goals and policies going through there. Um, this one obviously is, is narrowed down to the well steward parks, vibrant riverfront. Um, that's something we've been working on for several years is trying to reconnect the city with the river. Um, outdoor recreation hub, uh, park access, and then connectivity is another big one. Next slide, please. Next. So 20 year recommendation. Uh, they went through, like I said, uh, the consultants walked all of our parks along with the uh, park director at the time. I was not in the department at this time. Um, and took a look at everything we have, what we need to start replacing, what we need to build new. So you can see all those dots. This is in the pros plan too, if you wanna uh, take a longer look at it. But over our 20 years, we're looking at uh, roughly $94 million is what we need to do, everything that we wanna do in the pros plan. We don't have $94 million, we don't even have close to that. So um, two reasons why we put everything in there. Um, one is if you don't put it in, you can't apply for grants for it. Um, and then the, um, the second one is, is you need to get that list, that 20 year list. So the council has a choice to pick what priorities they would like to focus on. And so that gives them a laundry list to take a look at based on their feedback from the community, um, what projects they would like to focus on when we get down into our six year CIPs. And so, um, a lot of that is the council does a strategic plan every year and they identify their priorities. And so we take those priorities and then translate them down into our um, our capital facilities plans. And so from the 20 year, with the large document with everything in there, and then it scales down to a, a six year. Um, like I said, there's a lot of, of grant dependent projects in here. Um, over these next couple of years, uh, where we actually you know saved up and, and have the money. After that, you start getting out, especially with your larger parks, um, you know, you're talking, you know, five, $8 million to, to do these things. And so those will be grant dependent. And then a big chunk of this would be dependent on a bond. Next slide, please. And then uh, again, just from the outreach of going out to the community, you can see some of the funding priorities that came back from that. Um, you know, some of these are a little more on the general side, but it's just kind of, you know, tailored down for a snapshot and then priority goals, uh, the thing, the items that you just saw that were incorporated into the pros plan. Next slide, please. So you can see this is over our next six years. And if you see the, the, the color in purple, that indicates money that we don't have. And so you take all the way down there and you're looking at roughly $27 million is the, is the money we're looking at here. We are hoping, and this is this is still being discussed at looking at potentially in, in 2024, um, maybe a little earlier than that, maybe a little later than that, of going out to the um, the voters with the bond and see if they would like to pass a bond. It's dependent on a lot of different things. Um, when you go out for a bond, obviously you don't wanna run against, run at the same time that the school district's going out for a bond or the fire department's going out for a bond. And so those things are dependent and then um, and then you want to take a look at the economic times. Um, if you, you know, obviously you go down during very slow economic times, people are going to be less likely to do that. So that's why we haven't absolutely set a date yet. And next slide, please. And then uh, prioritiz prioritization criteria. Um, so this is something that um, that we took a look at also brought in front of the council when we were going through it with, well, I should say council committee, and then uh, took it to a workshop and then council as a whole um, of taking a look at the criteria and how to move forward on some of these proposed projects. And then you could see kind of this, uh, especially on the right-hand side, I'm pointing to the screen like you can see me. Um, on the right-hand side, you could see what we're looking for, if, you know, top of the list, underserved upper, upper represented groups, you know, safety and use, those kind of those kind of criteria go into into rating it. 
And then next slide, please. Implementation, so looking at the uh, at essentially six different areas here, um, the increased maintenance and assessed stewardship, that goes back to our, our current uh, or our existing level of service versus the level of service we'd like to be at. Number of full-time employees servicing the parks and those kind of needs. The parks crew also empties the trash cans in the downtown area, which I know get, you know, full up pretty fast, especially during the summertime. And so just taking look, a look at those things and what do the residents really want and where should we be putting our focus. Um, North Hill Park was one of them. Uh, grants is a huge one. We do it every single cycle. RCO, uh, their big grant cycles are roughly every two years. We did not rate very well in our, our last grant cycle. And so um, we have another year and we'll be coming up on that. And then um, uh, there's the number four, the bond I was just discussing, uh, master plan, the green belt. So what we're working on, and this is currently scheduled for 2024, is when we're planning on doing this, but doing a riverfront master plan. And so that would essentially tie in the Cadman parcel that will hopefully be under city's possession at that time, all the way up to um, Borland Park and, and master plan that area and then the uh, coordinate trails and transportation. And so that, like I said, we're starting our, our trails plan next year. That's actually gonna be done in coordination with public works because trails is a very loose term and public works maintains some areas that could be considered trails, specifically the, the very wide sidewalk going up Chain Lake. Um, that's something that, that public works has. And then not to mention, we're really looking to get people from point A to point B, so sidewalks come into into play sometimes when somebody wants to, you know, go on foot or or even on bike and get to our trail systems. Next slide, please. That should be it. Any questions? Andy. That was very informative. Thank you. I did have, a, um, we're talking about trying to get more money for the plan to be able to do more things that you have identified as priorities. On the implementation uh, slide, it said for, it was like a circle wheel on number three. It said apply for grants <clears throat> and approve new impact fees. What, can you tell me more what that means? That's a great question. So uh, the impact fees were already um, were already updated, and so what a going back a little bit. So what an impact fee is is we have um, uh, parks impact fees and transportation impact fees and school district impact fees, and what those are are it's a uh, a tool that's that the state allows local jurisdictions like counties and cities to impose on new development. And so if I come in and I want to build a new home in Monroe. Um, my impact or my buy into the system because the park system's already there and the school system's already there. So my buy into that system of what the existing tax base has already paid, that's your impact fee. And so for, um, for us here in the city, we actually did a fairly large increase. Uh, our single family uh, impact fees were roughly, I kind of want to say $2,500. And we've raised those up to roughly $7,000 is what um, a developer pays when they build a new home in the city of Monroe. Those impact fees are what's called restricted funds, meaning they can't just be used for anything. We can't go buy a new police car with it. Um, they're restricted funds and must be used on park capital improvements. They can't be, you can't hire employees with it. Um, you can't do uh, maintenance with it. It has to go towards building new facilities to accommodate that new growth. And that's what that impact fee goes towards. And so that one was already done. Was there a second part to your question, Commissioner Blair? No, so that that piece has kind of been checked off already. We did the increase for that. Correct. And what does that fund look like? I mean, does it have money in it? Uh, I haven't seen it recently. Um, it should be, we just did it in at, the beginning of this year is when it went through maybe end of last year beginning of this year um is when that fee went through unfortunately our housing started slowing about that time and so um so yeah i'd, I'd have to go back and look but it's yeah it's it's in our funds the um yeah the previous impact fee we had um again so impact fees the the way the 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 state dictates that is you can't charge a hundred percent of it 
um, on the developer of whatever the overall improvement is, but you can go up to and there's like a, I don't know, a, a court tested number that's like 96.2 or I don't know. Anyway, um, there is a methodology that you go through it. You can't charge the, the developer 100% of, of the of the overall impact based on your future capital facilities, um, but a council can lower that. So you're just restricted by the max and, and a council can choose not to take it all together. And so what had happened before is the, um, and it all depends on an economic cycle. So the previous time it was done in a, a downturn of an economic cycle. And I, from my understanding is they were trying to get additional building in the city of Monroe. And so it was a much lower impact fee. And so we just went through a, a six year period of, of collecting less than, than uh, less than ideal on it. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? Ben, I have a question. Shoot. Um, your little um, North Kelsey Park mm -hmm. at low uh, walk to score. Um, so, but who was walking to that particular area? That's in anticipation of residents on North Kelsey. Exactly. Exactly. And so, so that one we um, is, well, there's kind of, there's two things, I guess I should say two schools of thought with that is that um, it's weight on the residential units, which, you know, we are still working with Lowe's and there's a, their attorneys to work on the CCNRs. It's been going on for a long time now. Um, um, and so just wait for that amendment to take place get the developers to start building and move forward with the park. However, as you know, with our funding cycles and, you know, grants and those kind of things, it takes us a while. And so um, we could wait for the developers to come, they build it, you know, we wait, a, you know, it takes us a year or two to get out there, construct the parks and there's a delay, or if an opportunity should arise, build the park early um, in anticipation of that development coming down. Um, also, it would be just a an area that's really void of any type of, of park area to hopefully, and, and, and Chair Boy, you remember this from when we were talking about allowing residential uses down there, it's just, there's no life down there, getting some foot traffic down there, some people kind of enjoying that area. And so, um, but you're right, it's it's one of those things that I don't think we've 100% we've decided on. Um, obviously, there's a lot of needs going on right now. Um, the uh, downtown area, the festival lot that's identified in the downtown master plans also up there too. And so I, I don't know when that would be coming, but you're exactly right. It's based off that, that uh, projected population coming down there. Thank you. I do have another question. Sure. Um, when the consultants, so the walkability that you talked about being a half a mile or a 10 minute walk, Mm -hmm. And it sounded like that's a standard that's like a, like a federal standard or just a use. It's, it's an industry standard. And so you have, um, you have the National Parks and Recreation Office that um, usually develops the industry standards. And I was actually curious about that, that the same question you just asked a while ago. And so I started looking at it and um, I don't know who originated that standard. But like I said, it is it is referenced in the CDC um, uh, uh, National Highway Safety, I wanted to say, is the ones that actually translated the half a mile into an average 10 minute walk um, uh, as, as far as they were looking for what's the average time. Um, and there were a couple other organizations that referenced that. That doesn't mean that you have to go with that. Um, that can be something where, hey, we only want people to walk a quarter of a mile to a park. Um, and, and again, it's an, it's an industry standard. It's not a mandate, I, I guess is the best way to put it. Right. Because I think since most of the parks already look like they are within that distance, uh, especially mm -hmm. in town, but yet people on all of the surveys are saying that they want more access to parks and more parks. So then that must mean that in Monroe, we want a closer number of walkability, either minutes and quarter mile or whatever. How how do you go about changing that standard? Um, I, well, I think it's I think there's a there's a little more detail in in that. Um, it was a connectivity, and I know like right now we are not great with our bike lanes um, as far as separating the the bikes from uh, 
the the bikes from the road are, are getting an established bike lane. Um, that was part of one of the connectivity issues that we that we have is point A to point B where the individual riding feels safe. Um, the other one again is is the trail systems that it didn't really get started until we got into the Frylands area when the city really started pushing for a, a, a trail system going through there developments before then didn't have any and so we would be taking a look and i'd have to dive in but i know there was a number of things around connect uh, connectivity not uh even just it wasn't even necessarily related so much to proximity but i would like to hop from this park to this park to this park and i think that would be a fun day but i really can't get there without getting in my car and so there's it's it's a it's a a, a little deeper than just uh the proximity part i guess right. it's the safety and getting there so uh, that, that leads into my other question, which is the safety of getting there. So mm -hmm. consultants at all talk about if a person did want to walk to a park that was within their walking distance, um, if not a bike, but just walking, mm -hmm. then, um, there's not actually sidewalks and a safe way to get to some of these parks that say that they are within walking distance. Right. For us, yes. Okay. Is on that at all in the, it does it, is that reflected in the pros plan? Um, it may be a little bit, but that's what we really hope to accomplish with the with the trails plan um, is that and that's why public works is, is going to be joining us on this plan. It's not just going to be a, a parks thing, because some of our connectivity issues are sidewalks themselves. And so um, so when we go through and we take a look at that, um, we know, I mean, just citywide, we have missing connections throughout the city. And so as as part of this, we probably won't be looking city at every sidewalk in the entire city but we will be looking at connectivity issues with the existing parks perfect yeah so because i would have an example if you're trying to walk from downtown to the frylands park even or any anything in blueberry children's blueberry park let's say you have mm -hmm. to be strategic about where you cross because once you get to a certain spot there are no crosswalks. And then you'd have to walk all the way up to Highway 2 and cross at Rite Aid and Denny's and come back down, which <clears throat> most people aren't going to think that far ahead and try to cross somewhere else before then. So yeah, just trying to walk through uh, some of these park areas, uh, the connectivity could be improved. I'm glad we know that. Yes, yeah, no, and thank you for that comment. That's a, that's a good comment. Thank you very much for your presentation, Ben. Appreciate Great. it. Great, thank you. I appreciate it. And I'll probably be seeing you here fairly soon. Look forward to it. Great, have a good evening. Thank you very much. All right. There we have it, Anita. 7.1. You're back with our multifamily property tax exemption program. Yes, I am. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? I'm wearing a headset as well, hopefully. Okay, good. Yeah. Yes, as uh, Chair Bull said, I am here to uh, bring back the discussion on multifamily property tax exemption program or MFTE. So back in August, of 2022, our intern came to the Planning Commission and gave a great presentation on the multifamily property tax exemption program. And he gave an introduction and an overview. And so what I did was include the document that he created. So let's see. Um, so it's attachment one, considerations and additional summary information. So Liam created this document to basically go through the program, um, give you some information on how it works, um, the financial aspects of it, um, considerations as far as um, benefits to, to the city, benefits to developers, and then also gave an ex some examples of other cities that are using this program. So in doing the research for this agenda bill, um, it was discovered that the city has actually already established a residential targeted area and um, 
so so actually that's that's really good news as far as um, hopefully we can get this uh, code drafted a little earlier um, and get this through the, the code amendment process. And so I did attach uh, resolution number 2009-018. And this is um, where it established that uh, residential targeted area that is one of the requirements of RCW 34.14. And I'm just gonna share my screen just for, for a minute so I can show you, um, it is included in your agenda packet, but I did want to just go through that map. So let's see, share my screen with you. Okay, so here is, um, this is from the resolution that is in the packet. So this is a map of the downtown planning area. Um, and this is where it established the urban center. So what we're looking at is um, the entire uh, downtown planning area. We have um, in the blue and uh, black checkered outlined area, is um, encompasses the entire downtown planning area. Then we have um, the different colored areas, which is the different neighborhoods of downtown. And then this uh, blue slashed area that outlines um, the majority of the, of the colored area you see, that is the urban center for residential development. So this is the area of um, residential targeted area, the area that would be afforded that uh, tax exemption. So I'm going to stop sharing this real quick. Maybe. Oops. Um, maybe not because <laughs> I kind of lost you guys. Um, let me just. Okay, there we go. So um, in, in researching the resolution, I did find um, the actual ordinance. Um, so it's ordinance number 024 slash 2009. It was adopted on November 17th of 2009. And so what this ordinance did uh, was designate portions of the downtown planning area as an urban center. And it also, also uh, repealed um, chapter 18.74 and adopted a revised chapter, Affordable Housing Development Incentives. So um, this ordinance um, was transferred over when we, when we adopted the UDR. So it's essentially the same as it was uh, back in 2009. Um, there was some changes to it as far as updating information in there, as far as updating the zoning information and updating um, some chapter numbers in there, but it's essentially, essentially the same as, as um, when it was first adopted. So the good news is we already do have um, affordable housing chapter. And so that is chapter 22.52. And um, it does reference the RCW that implements the multifamily tax exemption code, um, but it's general in nature. So what we need to do is uh, revise this chapter so that way it's clear um, as to what the city's responsibility is, um, what the developer's responsibility is, how the program is run, how the program is monitored, um, also what uh, affordable housing um, incentives that we'll be putting in, in our code. And also if we're going to allow the eight year, 12 year or 20 year tax exemption. I'm just gonna go back to So um, the Department of Commerce recently came out with a MFTE guidance um, workbook. So, and I, I did also, also attach this to the agenda bill or agenda packet, but it's a great resource. Um, it, it's gonna give us the information on how we need to um, develop the program, administer the program, monitor the program. And it also has a model MFTE code. 
So it's not like we have to start from scratch. So there's there's something out there that we can um, emulate and then we can, we can add what we need to add. We can take out what we need to take out according to what is relevant to the city of Monroe. There's also some sample forms and materials. Um, so this is something that I'm gonna be relying on when I draft the code. I also put a link to the city of Snohomish's code. So they actually uh, passed their MFT uh, ordinance back in 2019. And it's actually um, under their finance title of their municipal code. So when we talk about this more, we can determine if we wanna put this in, our, in the finance title, or if we just wanna go ahead and revise the current affordable housing chapter. Um, and that's something we'll discuss um, through the process. So kind of next steps in developing this code is my plan is to take this back to planning commission in uh, January or February of next year. Um, the next meeting will most likely be a joint meeting with the Community Human Services Advisory Board. Um, they're really interested in providing input um, and we did talk to them when we were going through the housing action plan as this is one of our strategies in the housing action plan. Another thing that I would like to bring to Planning Commission is I would like to have the program manager for the Alliance for Housing Affordability come do a presentation and talk more about the financial implications for this tax exemption program. Um, so he, he worked closely with Snohomish on getting their ordinance passed. So he, he's a great resource and he'll be able to explain any questions that you have regarding that. Um, so that's, um, that's all that I have to discuss for tonight's meeting. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Oh, we got a question from Liz. I was just curious, when it comes to putting it in the finance chapter versus where it currently is, will you or will the various joint meetings and stuff help us to be able to figure out the pros and cons of which chapter we ultimately put it in? Yes, if um, so, I kind of wanted to get some thoughts tonight on, on where you see that going, if you'd if you like to see that under the finance chapter or the affordable housing chapter. Um, if we don't decide tonight, um, yes, I can definitely do a pros and cons um, matrix to see which, what works better, what other cities are doing, and then bring that back to you in our next meeting. What are the, what are the differences of leaving it where it is versus moving it to finance, I guess? Um, technically, finance would be a quicker way to get it through the process, but um, when I think about it a little bit more, I think maybe we would want to go through the um, uh, affordable housing chapter part that gives us the opportunity to include planning commission and also uh, the, the Cheshab board, because we definitely um, are definitely interested in providing comments on that. Yeah, I wanna... technically, oh, sorry, I was just going to say technically, if it just goes to the finance um, uh, title, then we can just go directly to city council. So that's just a quicker way to get it through. So um, Director Bailey and I have also been discussing this with Anita and our, our vision of how we're, we would like to move forward is adopting the base program, going through the planning commission and the other committee. But once it's approved, putting, because it's a two part, uh, it's a two piece program. You've got the land use requirements but then you also have a finance component and the finance component is going to, um, it's gonna change over time much more frequently than the land use. And so there's, um, we're kind of hoping there's a way to split that out, the components. So the land use really does stay with the planning commission where it's appropriate under title, or excuse me, yeah, title 22, the uniform development regulations, but the financial component, the taxation component go through finance. So it doesn't have to go through so many public hearings and it can be changed and updated more frequently. Anita, is the member um, from the Alliance that is coming, are, is the Alliance associated or affiliated with HASCO? Yes. Yes, it is. So they will also understand um, 
the financing part of the development part. Um, banks are um, required under the Community Reinvestment Act, CRA, um, to do their part to help finance certain projects um, for um, underserved communities or um, lower rent type um, buildings, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And then we can also, if there's still um, additional questions regarding the financial side, we can also see if we can have somebody from the um, assessor's office, uh, from the county assessor's office, come talk to us as well. Okay, and our decision or input and discussion, will it be planning commission with con, you know, consulting input? Um, or will there be um, some kind of discussion with the school district as well, since you know they might be affected in in a in a slight way, a moderate way. Um, I I haven't thought about that, but yeah, I can definitely include uh, the school district on any conversations that we have, any uh, planning commission meetings when we talk about this topic. That's that's a good idea to have them at least come to the table. Because it, it will, you know, hopefully increase their pupil count, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and it won't be as dramatic as um, mitigation fees, eliminating mitigation fees, but they might have a, uh, a revenue that is not increasing at the same level as they thought, correct? Um, their portion of the property tax. That's that's a that's a great question. I'll have to look into that. Yeah, definitely. Um, we were just speaking of the the Monroe School District. We were just informed that they decreased their uh, impact fees, but we were not given a copy of their capital um, six year capital facilities plan. So the city is still collecting more than what they're um, asking for. So we've got an interesting challenge. And we are tied because we can only update the comprehensive plan once a year or it's done with the budget, which has already been approved. So um, we are aware of that situation and trying to find a solution, which is separate from what Anita Those is working on. Mitigation fees, though. The school mitigation fees, yes. which are separate from the multifamily tax exemption program. But we will um, definitely do our due diligence and come back with uh, an answer for you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I want to say just this only affects property taxes, but yes, I will definitely um, find out for you if it affects any school taxes. Okay. I have a question. Is that fine? Yeah. Um, so can you help me understand? So when I when we first heard this about this, it sounded like this was a decision that we were going to have input on whether or not we wanted to initiate um, a tax exemption ordinance and then now it sounds like we may what do we already have in effect uh from 2009 and um why hasn't it worked or do we know that and um it sounds like you're already drafting stuff up in expectation that we are moving forward th with this i know some of the affordable housing is required through the comp plan but um if this is the way we're going to get there or not are we still discussing that or is this since we already have this 2009 thing does that make it different I i'm i feel like before it was just an idea and now it's something we're doing um yes yeah, so so I was surprised too that we already did have something in our code regarding the the MF, MFTE. So, but that is a great question because, um, like you said, 2009 has anything been has this program been used since 2009? Um, I think maybe Housing Hope has has used this program. That's something that I can um, I can get some details for you for the for the next meeting as well. But um, but but I am curious to find out too um, why have why hasn't this program worked or has it been working since two thousand nine, um, and then also since we do have it on the books, um, it's technically there for developers to use if they want to use it. It's just um, there has been updates um, as as Liam talked. There's been an update in two thousand twenty one to the RCW. So there's things that we need to change anyways um, in this code. So um, 
is there maybe we can just have a discussion on because I know you're right I know last time we said we um we were going to decide if we were going to move forward with this program and because of the new information that we do we do have now that there already is something in the code um what would what would the planning commission like to see happen um are we ready to move forward with the draft code or do we need a couple more meetings to discuss on on what we wanted to do well, I guess for me, since I'm just now like getting my head wrapped around that, okay, there already is something, mm -hmm. I guess um, the draft code would be good if it's showing the things that we have to incorporate Okay. and then a version of talking points about what else could be enhancements with the information of, since now we don't have a, to look at other cities to say, here's what's it's been working for them we have our own information we should have to say whether or not it's working or not so okay so I, I would like to add to that I don't believe the city actually ever used the the provisions that were established in 2019 it's like the building blocks were put in place but it was never fully implemented but we'll confirm that with our finance department because it it, it wouldn't just be housing hope it, it's the city of Monroe is giving up tax revenue over an extended period of time. And then it catches up once they are put back uh, 100% on the tax rolls. So I'm almost positive, but we will definitely get back to you before the next meeting on this. And was that because it just wasn't like advertised, well, you know? No, but this was back in 2009. And so some of these cities have just like, so Homa's just implemented in 2019, this um, kind of tax break situation mm -hmm. to increase multifamily. Mm -hmm. The River's Edge, they were able to do it without a tax break. They got um, sewer hookup um, mitigation or waived fees. And I think it was almost a million dollars. And you can verify that, but I believe that's what um, from, uh, Ben was community development director. I think that's what the, the total was that they um, the benefit they received was sewer mitigation fees and hookup fees were waived in order to get the affordable um, housing in that area. And you can verify that, but I don't think they got any sort of tax break. I'm almost 100% sure. Yeah, the other, the other component of that is the state law has changed. And so Anita and I were actually talking about this, um, or no, actually Anita and I weren't talking about this. Lance and I were talking about this earlier today. When this program started, it was for the really large cities, Seattle, Tacoma, uh, and then Linwood is able, because it was based on population. And the more recent changes really enable cities more like Monroe. So again, I, I want to do our due diligence and go back and see 20, in 2009, the pieces were put together, but um, I do not believe implementation will ever move forward or advance. And I also want to mention, Randy, that I pull um, apartment data every quarter. Mm -hmm. And Monroe is uniquely bad at building multifamily. We are isolated here. So people want to you know, live near family here or live near work here. They don't have a choice. You know, it's not like the difference between, let's say, South Everett and North Linwood. You can't just find an apartment like that. You have to go to Everett or Woodenville or Bothell or, you know, Sultan. That, that's, it's just a uniquely bad place to try and find an apartment. We have, you know, the last vacancy that I pulled is 3%, 3 3.1%. Um, that means there's not enough apartments. And all the apartments that are available are the two and three bedroom that are about 2,000 a month. Right, and so I guess I have two pop-up questions I've spurred, spurred from that. So these waived impact fees for the other apartment complex, how does something like that come then? If there's not a program for it um, through the tax exemption, is there some other exemption that we have that that's how they got it? The sewer fees being waived? I mean, we've been talking about how we need more money for everything and then giving up money for doesn't make sense to me, sure. I'll do the research on that. I'm too new to know what other programs are in place, but uh, I would look to Jay and I'll uh, 
again, but there are a lot of different programs that municipalities have access to for affordable housing. So I need to figure out what we've already adopted. Right, because then if they already have that, would they qualify for more than one or, you know, do we have enough? And I understand that the multifamily, we don't have enough of it here, but I'm just not sure that giving a tax exemption is the way to get more. We'll have a lot more information for you at the next meeting. I'm sure yeah, I just, want, I just wanted to make a quick comment on the sewer connection fee. So the city does have um, something in the code that for low, uh, for um, uh, affordable housing developments, and there is the there was a reduction in the sewer connection fee, and this re this related to the Rivers Edge project. Um, this is only for downtown commercial area, so it's not it's not um, citywide. It's only downtown commercial. So of the land use map that you showed us, the that's only a little portion of it, and then the rest is what this is needed for. So the map that I showed earlier, that's um, downtown commercial. So that's where the sewer connection fees are permitted. The reduction of sewer connection fees for affordable housing projects. Right. So that we already have something for the same area that we're talking yes. about. Yes. Yes. Correct. Correct. And would they qualify for both? Uh, yes, they would. Kelsey. So I was thinking the same thing as um, Commissioner Blair on who is this affecting if they're um, like, we have impact fees, but then they're getting waived. Um, like who's actually paying for this then? Um, uh, like who's, who are these, um, this budget falling on? Are they on just regular people or people just building? Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out where you're getting money places, but then waiving it. So. I don't know. Um, sorry, that's not a direct question, but no, just trying to figure out who's who's the budget falling on on in the grand scheme of all of this. Well, in general, a sewer hookup fee, the the city would charge a sewer hookup fee yeah. to either put that away to increase capacity um, at some point, or it would be to immediately start you know, increasing capacity if the development was so large that, you know, our solid waste treatment plant wasn't big enough. The situation with River's Edge, I believe, was that we had significant excess capacity in our sewage treatment plant. So the fact that they gave up some money, um, you know, for new um, sewage treatment plant infrastructure did not necessarily affect them because everything was already built, they had capacity, they'll be basically making it up because we have 166 units that are generating revenue on a monthly basis because that, you know, that it was so needed that it immediately filled up. It was like three months and the, the, the uh, all the buildings filled up with residents. So it's generating a monthly income to help sustain the solid solid waste treatment plant. Um, so that's the trade-off. So that's where budget's getting yeah. in, back into the yeah. Yeah. And, and we're talking about three very different financing tools. So the, okay. the sewer connection fee is one piece that Jay just explained. The next is the impact fees. And like Ben was talking about, we only have, um, we have transportation, we have parks, and the school district, we collect on their behalf. We're just a pass through, we don't keep those funds. And so impact fees are treated very differently. And then the multifamily tax exemption, that's talking about property taxes. Mm -hmm. And so in that instance, I believe in Liam's um, presentation, the way it was explained, and we will, again, I'm gonna have the experts um, give you much better information, but the way that it was explained is the, um, the initial construction has a cost but it's held, it's frozen for whatever number of years we've agreed to, the, the eight, 10, or was it 15, Anita? Um, eight, 12, or 20. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> it's frozen for that timeline. So the mm -hmm. city doesn't see the benefit of the annual increase until it gets to the end of its frozen period. Mm -hmm. And um, that loss, if you wanna call it, in revenue is borne by all, who live in Mer and Monroe and pay taxes. Okay. 
But in Anita's documents indicate that um, property tax revenue is, is less than 15% of the city's budget. Correct. And we're only talking about, I mean, we have 1,100 units, multifamily units in town in total. So the number of units that we're talking about that would get this property tax exemption, it's not huge. Because we realistically, I tell Anita this every quarter, right? Every three months, yeah. <laughs> like an old vinyl, we need 10% more multifamily units every year. And we're, and we're just not getting there. This conversation um, does make me think um, our finance director will be coming to the planning commission at one of your first meetings next year, kind of talking about financial literacy and the different ways the city is funded. I'm going to add this if she, um, let's see if she'll also address some of these questions. You're hearing it from our finance director as well. That's really great. Thank you. Yeah, and, and um, yeah, sorry, it's a little confusing about the different um, uh, impact fees versus connection fees and things like that. So, um, so there, the provision in our code that talks about impact fees, so school, transportation, and park. So there is a provision that allows 80% of a reduction of those fees for low income units. So if we're talking about this um, multifamily tax exemption program, only a certain, um, if it's gonna be a market rate housing uh, apartment building with, with a 20, let's say we choose 20%, 20% of those apartments are gonna be um, uh, affordable housing units. So only those units would, would be afforded the 80% reduction in mitigation fees. Not the other, not the other um, regular units. Anita, that was partially my fault that I muddied. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. So I apologize for That's okay. not keeping us on track with with this proposal and presentation tonight. I'm sorry about that. And I think, and I think when we we do have the program manager come from 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 AHA, I think that um, it's it's a little more clear on, like you were talking about, what happens. To the money, how does it get spread out? Um, the property tax money, how does it get spread out? How does it affect other property owners? So I think that would be a good good presentation. This is a really good conversation. So I have no concerns about it segueing. I mean, this is complex information and finances are really important because that's how things are paid for um, in the city of Monroe. So thank you. So I think in the meantime, um, I'll start working on the draft code, but um, it probably will be maybe one or two meetings before I bring that forth to you because we still have a lot more information that I'd like to provide you before we kind of make those decisions. Um, and then I also wanted to talk one, one other thing is, um, so in the last meeting, we talked about um, the eight, 12 or 20 year tax exemption and look like we were moving, we didn't want to offer the eight, the eight year because that doesn't um, offer any affordable housing unit requirement. So I think we were looking at the 12 and 20 year. So definitely work on getting that in the code um, and then um, move forward um, as we have a couple more discussions on this topic. Any other questions? Okay, I'm sure you have one. Do we know why there's not more multifamily or like, is there, do we have research on why this, is it too expensive to build or just people aren't interested in doing that or land too expensive? It's a compilation. You've got, um, you have the market demand, but more importantly, Monroe does not have a whole lot of land that is zoned mm -hmm. for multifamily. A lot of it is also um, in the downtown core. So it's not easily built you would have to demolish existing homes you'd have to consolidate lots and so it's not what we're like on. green fields where you can just build it, like up on the hill where the the single family homes are being constructed right Which now wouldn't make sense for a multi mm -hmm. well it, it might i mean we need we need to look at all options mm -hmm. but right now there's uh it's a constraint of land supply uh and how to develop what's available mm -hmm. i don't i don't think market is honestly the issue it's what we have for developers to construct. Got it. Yeah. Thank you, Anita. Thank you.
like we're on to section eight discussion. Well, is this really the section? I thought discussion by commissioner staff was after your section of presentation. Well, this used to be added in new business, but I don't believe either of these topics really rise <laughs> to the importance. Okay. So I asked Apologize Hannah- Apologize for my to, confusion. My apologies. I just thought it was more applicable in the discussion. Um, and the first, the first one is just, I want to thank you all for your work this year. You accomplished like 90% of the projects we had, um, on, in, in your packet is included the, uh, program of work that you adopted back in May, I want to say, uh, a couple of the items got pushed out. So the downtown commercial zoning code amendments, the 2019 stormwater plan, the current six-year capital facilities plan, updating the um, uni um, unified development regulation definitions that actually just got approved by city council. So thank you again for all your work on that. Um, and then I just wanted to also highlight the items that are being integrated to the comprehensive plan process. And there are two items on there that are um, we will take up after the completion of the comp plan. So. Uh, job well done, and I will be coming back to you in January to figure out what this list is for 2023. I'm very hopeful that our um, comprehensive plan consultant uh, has established a more detailed uh, calendar, because I know that is of interest for the Planning Commission, and that really should be most of our work next year. So that completes that. Are there any questions? Probably just the bottom line for us, Kate. Sure. Could you assure us, commissioners, that there will be no coal in our stocking because we did so well this year? <laughs> there will be no coal. You did a great job. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. And then the next one, um, I apologize for the late um, edition. Hannah sent out a very late um, revised agenda for this evening. I realized... Um, Commissioner Bull had been asking, oh, so we're going to have the community development monthly report. And I thought we were putting them in and I was wrong. So in your packet this evening, you have all of our reports going back to May. And some of the things, um, the way they're set up is the first part talks about a project that we're highlighting. So there were um, a townhouse project, the one for November, December was actually um, completion of a major code enforcement case that the house has actually been completely redone and a new family has recently moved in. Another highlight was we are going through a huge record retentions, uh, record retention program. Part of getting ready for a new city hall is we need to get rid of our paper copies. The other part is once you digitize them, it actually helps the community as well as staff finding old plats, boundary line adjustments. Um, I won't say building permits because under the retention record, um, after those are, once you have occupancy, I can't, it's like 120 days, those are supposed to be um, destroyed. But the bigger projects, you'll have much easier access to them. And that's, um, that was, I think, last month's update. From the land use side, it is a compilation of all the projects going on. And we've been talking about housing. I just went through all of the project lists. There are 153 new units being created for projects that are in one form or another um, through the review process, either from a short plot, which is nine or um, fewer lots in the preliminary stage under civil construction or have been finaled and houses are being constructed. Some of the other highlights um, that I have not been bringing to you, again, my apologies. Uh, Adventure Sports, their property is on North Lewis. Um, it's, let's see here, north of the railroad tracks on the west side. It's going to be a multi-building um, facility for sales and repair of um, uh, Adventure, or what I call it, Adventure Sports, but RVs, or not RVs, ATVs. Um, the Sky Valley Food Bank, uh, they did an addition to their, well, they were approved for an addition to their building. Monroe Gateway is a RV showroom and storage facility that uh, is proposed at the very end of West Main Street. Um, there's a coffee stand there at the moment on the south side of 
Main Street, um, just adjacent to the SR 522. Uh, the Monroe Christian School, they've been working on bringing in a modular classroom. So that's, uh, it has site plan approval, but it doesn't have approval from the building department. The other one is the Lakeview building. That's the one at Frylands Boulevard in US 2. They've got their foundation now, and it looks like they're getting close to putting the walls up. Um, ideal option, I know several of you had some questions about this. This is the conditional use permit for a substance abuse medical clinic, outpatient medical clinic that was approved. That's at 101 East Main Street. Is it Maine or Lewis? It's on the corner of Maine and Lewis. That was approved. We did not receive any appeals. They are working on their um, building permit now for some tenant improvements. Um, the Snohomish County PUD, this project is actually, Anita can answer any questions for you, but this is um, the project that's on Turney Place. They're working on construction right now. And then we have two annexations that are in process. Uh, the Connor annexation is a single parcel that's adjacent to the high school or it's next to the high school property in our Southwest urban growth area. The applicants have already um, gotten through the 10% petition method and they have returned their 60% signature. So the next step is working with the county and then we'll go back to city council to see if they wanna finalize that not, or not. The North 41 annexation area is our Northwest UGA. And um, these are in your packets. There's a map of a little description of that. It also received 10% petition approval and the council said, um, with that adoption, they get to move forward in collecting signatures. This one is going to be a little bit more complex. They need sewer from the city of Monroe. They have water from the Roosevelt um, Water District. And one of the things that city staff met with, one of the proponents is there are multiple developers. There are 41 acres. I cannot remember the total number of parcels but the city does not want it to be uh, an uncoordinated development. We want it to be phased appropriately. We wanna make sure that the road system network makes sense. And so we've actually asked the, fair, um, the I think I wanna say it's like four development groups. We want them to work together before they come back to us. We need, we need some kind of a plan, not just to approve the annexation. So, that um, we have not heard back from them. Uh, that meeting was over the summer. So I don't have any, any more updates. Can I have a question sure. about that? Sure. Isn't that one of the requirements of the GMA is that sewer and water is already in uh, to these areas for development? It's a little murky, but the city of Monroe adopted amendment an amendment in oh, it was 2018 or 2019. Prior to that, there, the city could extend sewer into an unincorporated urban growth area where we're gonna grow into. Uh, the city had done that and we required, it's called a no protest agreement. So the city would come back and say, all right, it's time for you to annex. You got the utilities you wanted. We want you to develop like uh, what the city wants, not the county. So prior to the code change, and the reason I'm saying it's not um, cut and dry is there, I want, I, I can't remember, and I'm apologizing because it's an area that I was really familiar with, and then I stepped away from planning for a while, at least land use. Um, if a, for example, if there was a property in an urban growth area and they were on septic and their septic system was failing and they're um, adjacent to a municipality that has sewer service, there were, back in the day, and again, I don't know, remember if it was state law or the requirement, but we could be um, encouraged, forced to provide sewer. I don't know what's happened with that because again, it's been gone for 14 years. But the mayor, this was an, uh, really important to him. So back in 2018 or 2019, the city actually passed uh, an ordinance that says we will not extend sewer unless you annex. So yes and no, and it's complicated when you're a satellite city like Monroe. We are not part of a conglomeration of cities. And so hopefully going forward, we will not be extending sewer until you annex. Well, I mean, since the goal of GMA is to keep growth 
where it belongs. Where do we and know? then mm -hmm. we don't want sprawl, but then we do this. And then as soon as that those are annexed, then the next one that makes it an adjacent property to an annexed, and then you have sprawl. When we're trying to infill and look at our zoning for where we can get more people inside the city limits already, mm -hmm. and we know we're not maxed out with that, and then continuing to grow out because somebody brings it to us, not because we need it. Yeah, those are when the city establishes its urban growth area is acknowledging at some point that that area should become part of the city. Um, with that being said, these are all policy decisions that are made by the planning commission's recommendations to city council. And it takes thorough review of what are our targets? What are we being told that we need to accommodate? So I agree with everything you said, but it's complicated. <laughs> You just, it's like, we hear this thing where it's already the, we already have a uh, ordinance saying we won't do this mm -hmm. and then, and then we're doing it. So like, it just seems like that's a lot of the theme. <laughs> well, for, for North 41, in order for them to develop on sewer at city densities, they will have to annex. They don't get sewer um, because our city changed our rules. It was important again to the current administration that we will not extend sewer. So, but that area is in the city's urban growth area, and it is identified for our needs as we grow years out. And wouldn't we rather have it annexed in so the city has, um, you know, provides direction on how it's developed rather than definitely let it be developed by the county? The county is the, you know, they're they don't have any any problem with sprawl, right? right? So, so I hear what we're saying is since we're forcing the annexation, that is why that ordinance in the past that the mayor wanted is important because without that, they could be still doing this, but through the county and we wouldn't have oversight of what they were making them coordinate their plan and all that. Yeah. And our urban growth area development there, it's a really complex issue because the, the county has certain Property owners have certain rights. And so when I was here previously, there was a plat that was approved. It was it was only a handful of lots, but they were put on septic systems. And you don't want that either because it's where the city expects to grow. And we want things to happen the, the way the city wants. And so um, I think where Monroe is today is a much better place and it does encourage the developers to coordinate before the city would accept the annexation. The counter to that is the development that's occurring north uh, of, the, of the farm. The city, this is before the, our regulations changed, the city extended sewer, there's a huge subdivision that's going in. It's not following our regulations, it's following the codes. The county. In reverse, we would really want to annex before subdivisions are approved. So this new one should be better. I hope so, yes. And when you say coordinate, like roads coordinate, that means it has an exit. It doesn't, you don't go in and you're not able to get out except where the entrance is, right? Yes. Um, well, we, um, again, back over, over the summer, we did meet with one of the developer groups and we were very clear with them that as you're thinking of development of this area, not only do we want you to figure out a um, thoughtful road network, but we also want you to figure out or think about how that area is gonna connect to the city. Because right now they're gonna have to go through Robin Hood, come down 179th and so, or go back out um, to Roosevelt Road. So we want them to be thinking about these connections because once the city takes it on, like Ben was talking about with parks, we have to maintain it. So it's really important to us that they're, they're being thoughtful on how they're designing future development. Um, so that's all I have for you. Any questions on the developments? Thank you for all the... Uh all the information on the developments. I appreciate it. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. It helps us because people ask us, what's going on? Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, 
earlier before the meeting started, Hannah and I have this figured out now. <laughs> you will be getting them on a monthly basis. On to the rest of the discussion, shall we? Okay, thanks, Kate. Appreciate that. <laughs> Start with um, our Zoom folks. Liz, do you have anything for us this evening? Um, not much. Just economic development last week was pretty good. We we're <laughs> they were really great and excited to hear that we we're talking about land uses. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it was. Great times, um, but they were we were talking about the city's new branding and all that good stuff. Uh, this business surveys are going to be coming out. Um, I guess it's been coming up a lot about there's a lot of feedback coming from business owners about wanting streamlining and permit processing. That's all I got on that one, so I'm not quite sure what more. I I don't know outside of that, and I was like. Take that back to planning. I don't know what I do with that. So, anyways, <laughs> but it was a good meeting. So, we're working on our budget for the next couple of years and subcommittees and all that stuff. We also have new members. So, but it was good. That's all I got. Liz, so permits, do they mean building permits? Yeah, I'm not sure. Hmm. I'll ask Lance. I know he attends those meetings. Awesome. Anita? Well, since this is our last meeting of the year, I just wanted to thank everyone for their work and for volunteering your time. It's, um, you know, it's just great that you're involved with the community and you're helping us make decisions. Um, and I also just wanted to say happy holidays and happy new year and looking forward to, to working with you next year. Great, thank you very much, Kelsey. Um, I also wanted to say thank you. This has been very informative the last couple months, and I'm still excited to help, but um, need to learn more <laughs> on everything. But so thank you guys. Your presentations are amazing. Really look up to you both, Nita and Kate. Um, so thanks for all your hard work. Awesome. Jenna? I just want to say thank you to everyone for. Um, just everything breaking it down i'm new i haven't been here too long but just sitting back and just listening and taking everything in and then i love it when you break it down into like new commissioner terms right um so because i haven't been here for a long time so um, i'm looking forward to next year and just serving and getting to learn more and so i appreciate everyone happy holidays and Winter break starts next week for the school district. Looking forward to that. Awesome. Thank you, Hannah. You're amazing. You're so amazing. <laughs> so thank you for everything you've done. Brandy? Uh, I want to say that Kelsey, uh, her term does end this year, but she had reapplied and she was um, reapproved last council meeting. So that's a go. We'll all be on the same team again for one more year. Yeah, no changes to the planning commission would be a good idea for a little while. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm glad you said we have done so much because sometimes it feels like there's more to do. And so it feels validating that you that from your guys' perspective, we got some stuff done. And even the stuff that's on hold and, and whatnot, it's I know we discussed all of that. And so it's it's somewhere in the process. Um, I just wanted to mention, I'm not sure if anyone's been paying attention to zoning stuff that's going through city council right now with the airport property. Um, I just want to use this as a example for us to be careful with what we do uh, here in changing things. Um, the definition for the tourist commercial zoning was a great idea. We'd like to see touristy things there. Um, the wording wasn't quite concrete enough to not exclude certain uses. So um, the property owners now feel that a sale is being thwarted because we're now trying to change the definition. Um, so what we what we do, like those definitions that we went through so much and what the code 
uh, amendments that we might end up implementing after the comp plan, it's just really important that we're getting it right the first time because trying to fix your mistake afterwards um, can look um, retaliatory or like you're picking uh, on a certain area. So be careful. And the people involved are now, you know, longtime residents, they're upset. Uh, it's not what we want out of the situation at all. So. And I hope everyone has a nice Christmas ish holiday break and um, see you all back next year. I just wanted to say thank you to all the new commissioners in 2022. Um, thank you to all the new staff in 2022. Um, and it's just going to be good to have a cohesive unit, sleeves rolled up to grind through this comprehensive plan. And Randy, it does seem glacial sometimes, but it's a process and it's a well thought out. It's, it's kind of like a machine and it just chugs along. And sometimes it feels like you spent two hours and you don't know if you accomplished anything, but eventually it chugs its way through the snake, gets to city council, gets approved and on we go, right? It's, it's not like regular business where, you know, you're the CEO, you make a decision, off you go. This is, everybody has input, everybody has to be recognized, it's a process, and you just have to know it's a process. So it's just going to seem slow sometimes, but that's just the way it is. And again, that's a good reminder, your reminder to us, be thoughtful always. That's why sometimes it, it is slow, because you have to, you have seven commissioners and very experienced staff telling you, here's all the repercussions if you make a quick decision right mm -hmm. so you try and think of everything I know the airport property is super unique and we were super constrained about you know how we could word it because it is you know a unique property it's not like you know the downtown commercial zone is so I mean it was just hard but happy holidays to everyone and I appreciate everyone's work thank you Kate? So I do want to actually touch on the tourist commercial uh, situation that's going on. The city council took emergency uh, action on October 25th, adopting interim regulations that removed all of the government facility uses for that zone. And it's not applicable to one property. It's applicable to the entire tourist commercial zone, which is very unique. It is on both sides of the fairgrounds. There's about 27 total parcels. And so depending on, um, there was a public hearing on uh, December 6th. It was continued to tomorrow night. Depending on what the council decides, you will be getting this project in January um, because it's an interim ordinance or an interim regulations. It's just like the downtown commercial project. It has a six month time frame. At any time, the council could choose to repeal it, in which case it goes away to the way it was, or you continue on your work, you hit about six months, you're like, we don't have enough time, we need more conversation, and we go back to the council and say, we need a six-month extension. So uh, tomorrow evening's council meeting might be an interesting one to watch. Either way, we will be updating you. Um, Trying to think if there's anything. Oh, so um, on that, the council uh, in, back in October considered three different options. And it's um, they looked at a moratorium, which was really the most restrictive. And they decided that that was not the way to go because it would really impact any property, including the airport for development. We would not accept any building permits. The second option that they considered was what they went with, which is removing the government facility land uses from the code. And the final option was um, looking specifically at outdoor storage. Um, I, I'm actually kind of hopeful that they do give it to the planning commission because there are other uses that I believe you need to reassess. Um, this, the tourist commercial zoning district was adopted in 2019 when you adopted uniform development regulations. It was a lot of information kind of fire hose coming to the planning commission and city council that was again why anita worked on the definitions earlier this year 
that's also why we worked on the downtown commercial. So, and I think Ben has said too many times, the UDR is like a new engine in a car. You're going to have to run it a while to figure out how it needs to be fine-tuned. To me, this is another one of those issues. So we'll see what the council decides and uh, it could be on your program of work next year. Other than that, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah, happy new year. And uh, hopefully it doesn't snow next week. <laughs> and uh, it's been a pleasure working with you. I'm very excited about next year. Thanks, Katie. Cool. Well, I just want to thank Kate for jinxing us by saying the word snow. <laughs> um, I do have something for everyone tonight um, on behalf of Jody, our city clerk. Um, Senator Brad Hawkins, the 12th district, is going to be here hosting sort of like a town hall. Uh, I think he has a presentation and then there will be a Q&A. Um, that's going to be Friday, December 30th uh, from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. So um, when we have more information on what the discussions will be about, I'll be routing it your way. Um, but yeah, otherwise, thank you all so much for a great year. I'm coming up on one year with the city, one year with you guys. So it's been um, a really great learning experience. I take away a lot from our meetings. So thanks for your patience with me. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Very nice. When That's you, all I've got for you. That's all? Yeah. I think we're good then. Jerry, anything from IT? <laughs> uh, no. Thank you for, uh, thanks for having me. And um, see you guys in a year. Right. <laughs> right on. Anyone like to move for adjournment? I move the Adjourn, Thanks, Kelsey. I'll second that. Thanks, Brandy. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion passes five to zero. Thanks very much. <laughs>